Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to Words for Palestine, an evening of prose, poetry, and solidarity, featuring the writers Suzanne Maaddi Daraj, Lisa Suhair Majaj, Leila Halabi, and Ghassan Zainuddin. My name is Diana Bali. I'm the director of the Arab American National Museum, located in Dearborn, Michigan, just outside Detroit. It's my pleasure to be moderating this event tonight and to be in your company, wherever you may be. Um, Hassan Zainuddin, one of the authors who'll be reading tonight, reached out to me and my colleague Fatima Rasul, who works in the public programming uh, department at the museum, uh, a few weeks ago and presented to us an idea of bringing together Arab American writers. He had been talking to a group of writers um, and they were wondering how they could show up and shed light on the atrocities that are happening in Gaza right now. And after some discussion, some back and forth, tonight is the result of those discussions. So I want to thank Hassan, and I want to thank all those other writers for trusting us uh, to host this event. As of this evening, over 20,000 Palestinians have been killed through a relentless bombing campaign targeting Gaza over the last 75 days, carried out by the Israeli government and military with a clear and deliberate objective of genocide and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. Of those 20,000 killed, about one third are children. In fact, Gaza is the most dangerous place in the world for children right now. The 20,000 dead does not include the countless men, women, and children under lying dead underneath the, all the rubble. On top of this, 50,000 people are wounded. Most of Gaza's 2.2 million residents have been internally displaced barely eking out an existence on the brink of starvation, without access to clean drinking water, without, with most, if not all, urban infrastructure, including healthcare, destroyed. So indeed, we are here tonight, us, the writers, we're here to bring some awareness to what's happening in Palestine. But despite all this death and destruction, we also want to shed light on life and to affirm that we Arabs, Arab Americans, Palestinians are alive. A few weeks after the start of the war uh, on Gaza, I was watching um, an interview with the poet Fadi Judah, who mentioned in the interview, um, or said, asked a question of why Palestinians only appear on the media, on TV, either as terrorists or as dead, as being dead. And that really struck with me. And so tonight, even though we are here um, to bring awareness to what's happening in the occupied Palestinian territory, I also want us to sort of to celebrate um, the fact that we are here, we exist, and we're alive. And we're doing that through uh, words and through stories and through our culture. I want to thank our partners for tonight, Mizna and Palestine Rights, and also all the, the writers, the four writers who are here with us tonight from whom you'll be hearing um, in a short while. We encourage all of you, uh, the audience, to make a donation to support the work of both or either uh, Palestine Legal or and the Child Palestine Children's Relief Fund. Palestine Legal is an organization dedicated to protecting the civil and constitutional rights of people in the United States who speak out for Palestinian freedom. PCRF is a humanitarian organization in Palestine that provides crucial and life-saving relief and humanitarian aid in Gaza. So as you can see up here, um, there are two QR codes, one for PCRF and the other one for Pal Legal. And I assume one of my colleagues will be dropping a link in the chat box uh, for you to uh, access. So please uh, consider making a donation. These donations will go straight to those, um, uh, those organizations. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, turn uh, to the writers that you're here to, to, to hear. Um, each writer will be reading an excerpt from their work and possibly the work of another poet. They'll be recommending writers uh, that they would like you to read. We encourage you very much to go out and buy their books. And we encourage you as well to ask your libraries to purchase their books as well. There's been a sort of campaign targeting a lot of artists and writers. Um, and we really need to show support for them in this time. So without further ado, um, the first writer will be Leila Halabi. 
in addition to more than 75 poetry, short story, and essay publications, Leila Halabi is the author of a memoir, The Weight of Ghosts, two novels, Once in a Promised Land and West of the Jordan, which is a winner of the Pen Beyond Margins Open Book Award, and two collections of poetry. She holds two master's degrees and was a Fulbright recipient. Leila lives in Tucson, Arizona, where for the last decade she has worked to merge her two career paths, counselor and writer, by working with community groups and organizations to create trauma-informed, expressive arts programming that serves veterans, refugees, homeless youth, as well as a general population. Thank you, Diana. And thank you. I, I'm so impressed with um, the swiftness with which this was put together. And you know that's due to all the writers and the organizations. So thank you for that. Um, and as Diana mentioned, this is threefold. The, the goal of this is threefold. You know, we want to raise awareness. We want to raise money. Um, but we also want to support our brothers and sisters who are living through unimaginable horrors. And, you know, I always like I stop when I get to that because it's because it's unimaginable, right? It's just too much. Um, and I think a lot of us feel like, you know, we there's not enough we can possibly do. So one of the goals here is to show you that we're here. And, and you know, I have this vision of like our words linking, sort of this chain, not so much a chain, but like mesh, uh, linking, linking, linking. A lot of people are speaking up and I, imagine those all of those words linking together and holding you up um and in in that you know we all were reflecting on how there are other writers who have influenced us who are not here for any number of reasons um and the the writer i want to acknowledge is maruf rafiq mahmoud um he was born in Anapta in Palestine in 1934, and from 1967 on lived in exile, both in Saudi Arabia and in Qatar, where he died in 2005. Um, <clears throat> and he helped to establish school, I'm reading this part now, so I get it right, but he helped to establish school theater in both countries and wrote musicals. Um, his poems are often used to teach language in simple form. And as his son Marwan said, um, making us the people responsible for every plant, animal, and natural resource, which I love. But the reason I'm choosing him um, is sort of an indirect, that's sort of the, the, the idea of words as linking generations. Um, it was the love that he had for words and for poetry and for Palestine that really helped, that he transmitted to his family that helped to form the foundation of my own literary understanding. Um, but more recently, they, a young man in Gaza came across, or I, maybe I can't remember how they, they, they found each other, but he wanted to turn one of his poems into a song. And so we're going to play just a wee tiny bit of it. Uh, this is Sami El Madhun. And uh, Jacob is going to play you just, just a wee bit so you get a, a flavor for it. And I love that. And what I love about it is that, you know, we're what, four generations out and these words still affect us in all sorts of different ways. Um, so you can, you can look these two up also. Um, okay, so even though I did have a memoir published this year and a collection of poetry published last year, um, I am going to read tonight from 
uh, a novel that I completed around 2015 called Woman Be My Country. It has as one of its main characters, the daughter of one of the main characters from West of the Jordan. So this is Soraya's daughter. And I feel like we need her right now. Uh, her name's Philistine Salama. And she lives in Los Angeles. She goes by Fila. She's never been out of the States. Uh, she currently works as a barista, but she draws comics. She draws like graphic novels and they're more like supernatural sci-fi sort of stuff. Um, so this is gonna be a little bit of her and then a little bit of one of her stories. I make coffee for strangers and have nothing to my name except the stories I make up. Instead of buying designer clothes or watching stupid shows or drinking alcohol, I buy tabloid papers and get lost in impossible possibilities. Aliens landing, interspecial mating, extreme weight gains and losses. Any kind of excessiveness is vitamins for my comics, which I usually try out loud on my relatives. When I'm with my young cousins, I make up adventures about ninja princesses and wheelchair bound superheroes. For my older aunties or grandparents, there's always a political or cultural twist. Did you hear that aliens landed in Gaza and sucked up all the Israeli soldiers and checkpoints into their vacuum cleaner and then sent them into outer space in a giant bubblegum pod? My grandfather speaks English well, but sometimes it's like he has a delayed internal translator and there will be a silence for a second or two after I finish talking while his UN lady is still saying the words in Arabic. He cracked a smile. I didn't hear that. The pictures must have been spectacular. They were phenomenal. Lit up the night sky for two days in pink. All of my stories are big and colorful, over the top. But what I'm working on now is the opposite. Lulu Biswas, surgeon, superhero. Fight dehumanization with superhumanization, I always say. The drawings for this strip are black and white with clear lettering and one dab of color in one frame on each page. It starts with Lulu's backstory and each episode is a new adventure of how she saves someone using a combination of her mortal and spirit powers. And then it goes to Lulu. Dr. Lulu Biswas, the first female surgeon in the city, walked through a Shifa hospital. Her thick braids hung heavy against her white coat. Swish, squeak, swish, squeak, were her shoes against the floor. Shouts in the distance, never quiet here, and generator hums, and she kept walking. Swish, squeak, swish, squeak. With each step she took, she felt the presence of the dead. Some came to her as gentle pushes against her chest, others in the form of whispered pleas sliding against the skin of her ear. The worst were the shrieks. When she heard those, she pushed them aside and walked faster. Squeak, 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 squeak. That's when the bomb hit. Had she been on an upper floor and not distracted by ghosts, she might have heard the whistle, might have sensed the impending destruction, no one is fool enough to feel safe anywhere, not even in a hospital. When Lulu Biswas was a young girl, she had fixed broken animals, injured birds and starving cats. She was a savior for the needy and broken. After she mended them, she fed them and helped them to become self-sufficient. So it was no surprise that she went to medical school and then became a surgeon. Gaza is a dense place and energy booms off of everything. On that terrible summer day in 2014, it didn't take long for the ghosts of birds and cats and dogs and babies and grown-ups to work their way down to Lulu's dark and dusty almost tomb. They squeezed themselves through all the rubble and covered her bubbling her so that she was protected from the chunks of rocks and dark and lack of air, mended her broken parts and kept her blood flowing until help could come, 
which it did eventually. And then back to Fila. Illustrating Lulu's superpowers fills me with a new kind of energy. When I paint the bright blue swatch on the bottom of one of her braids for the white-breasted kingfisher who gave her the gift of flight, I feel as if I too can fly. When I paint one ear a golden brown for the street dog who gave her the gift of hearing conversations that need to be heard, I heard people talking from around the block. It is as if by creating it in my character, I am creating it in reality. A doctor who can move like a cat with the strength of a donkey. I feed bits of her story to my grandfather. This is important, Ya Philistine. The truth is that you are writing what is already there. Our superheroes come in all forms. Some have braids like you or hijabs or beards. Some wear sneakers. Many carry scalpels and stethoscopes and others wield cameras and pens and paintbrushes. Thank you. Thank you, Leila, so much. Um, next up is Hassan Zainuddin. Hassan Zainuddin was born in Washington, DC and raised in the Middle East. He is the author of the story collection, Dearborn and co-editor of the creative nonfiction anthology, Hadha Baladuna and Arab American narratives of boundary and belonging. Dearborn was named the best fiction book of 2023 by, by Kirkus Reviews, book list, the Chicago Public Library, and Powell's, among other places. Hassan lives with his wife and two daughters, in, two daughters, two daughters sorry, in Ohio, where he is assistant professor of creative writing at Oberlin College. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Diana, um, for those words. And um, I just wanted to also thank the amazing staff at the Arab American National Museum for putting this all together. Uh, and thank you to our virtual audience for being here. Um, it's just a great honor to share this space uh, with Leila, uh, Lisa, and, and Susan. Um, so before um, I read from my own fiction, I thought I would read a poem by the Palestinian-American uh, writer Naomi Shihabnai uh, from her collection titled The Tiny Journalist, which came out just a few years ago. And the poem that I'd like to read is titled Moon Over Gaza. And the poem is told from the point of view of the moon. So moon over Gaza. I am lonely for my friends. They liked me, trusted my coming. I think they looked up at me more than other people do. I who have been staring down so long see no reason for the sorrows humans make. I dislike the scuffle of bombs blasting very much. It blocks my view. A landscape of grieving feels different afterwards, different sheen from a simple desert, rubble of walls, silent children who once said my name like a prayer. Sometimes I am bigger than a golden plate, a giant coin, and everyone gasps. Maybe it is wrong that I am so calm. Um, I'll now read the, uh, the opening pages from my short story titled The Actors of Dearborn. Um, and this short story is the opening story of my uh, debut collection um, uh, titled Dearborn. And um, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Dearborn uh, it, it is, it is in Michigan, it borders Detroit and has the highest concentration of Arab Americans in the country. And it's actually commonly referred to as uh, the capital of Arab America. Um, so these are just like the opening uh, pages. And I, I, I should say that um, what's unique about Dearborn is that there are many different Arab ethnicities, uh, including um, a, a, um, a thriving Palestinian community, Lebanese, Yemeni, Iraqi, Syrian. So this is the actors of Dearborn. Before arriving at Uncle Sam's house on the corner of Gould and Coleman streets, Yusuf Bazi had been canvassing the neighborhoods in East Dearborn, Michigan for over a month, knocking on doors throughout the day and late into the night, despite the heat or rain. His new job as census taker afforded him flexible hours, and at this point in his life, he preferred to be outdoors. 
He was 31, and although tall and slim, he had grown a small belly since he had started canvassing in early August. He blamed his extra weight on the neighborhoods. East Dearborn was predominantly Arab, and among the Lebanese population, the Bezdi family was one of the biggest. Yusuf was born and raised in the area and knew most of the people on each block, at least by face. Whenever a resident, quite often a fellow Bezi, saw Yusuf standing on their porch with his ID badge dangling from a lanyard around his neck, a census-issued laptop in his hand, and his and a census-issued briefcase hanging from his shoulder, they quickly invited him inside, sat him down in the living room, and brought him a glass of soda or lemonade mixed with orange blossom water, followed by a salty snack or perhaps a dessert and a cup of Turkish coffee. If it was around lunchtime or dinner, he was fed, and fed well. If Yusuf had refused the food, he would have offended his fellow Jibbonites. After dusk, when the men and women sat on their porches or in their open garages to smoke a hookah, sip tea, and crack pumpkin seeds between their teeth amid the fireflies flickering in the air, Yusuf was urged to take a seat and enjoy a puff from the hookah. The wind carried the scent of apple-flavored tobacco. Children ran across the lawns and rode their bicycles down the sidewalk in the streetlight filtering between the trees. Every so often, a car blaring Arab pop music thundered past. The modest brick houses were built so close to one another that Yusuf could simply cross the driveway and step onto the next person's property. I thought you were working for Ford, many folks told Yusuf. I don't need Ford, he said, feeling emboldened. He had previously worked in the communications department at the Ford Motor Company, where he had languished for years in a cubicle until he was laid off in the latest rounds of cuts. Yusuf's new job was to verify addresses and update residents' information in preparation for the 2020 census. But he often went off script. Are you happy in life, he'd ask. Have you become what you've always wanted to be? I didn't know the census was so personal, one resident said. I'm here to listen, Yusuf said. When Yusuf came across his former high school classmates, they all greeted him as Broadway Joe. Uncle Sam had given him this Americanized nickname back when Yusuf was a teenager and dreamed of acting in Broadway plays. Yusuf had starred in all the plays staged at Fortson High, sometimes even performing female roles. According to Mr. Emerson, his English teacher and theater director, his most memorable performance was as Abigail Williams from Arthur Miller's The Crucible. I don't understand this acting business, Yusuf's father had told him after opening night of The Crucible. Yusuf's parents had sat in the first row, horrified at seeing their son dressed as a witch. You're a man, Yusuf, a man, be like your brother, his father said. At the time, Yusuf's older brother was a starting fullback on the varsity football team and known as a Lebanese Express for his ability to plow through defensive linemen. But Yusuf had no interest in sports and had never tried out for any of the teams. The head football coach could hardly believe that Yusuf and his brother were related. Guess there's only one express train in the family, the coach had said. All Yusuf cared about was the stage, the spotlight hot on his skin, the wooden floorboards squeaking beneath his feet. The Arab boys in his class and in the neighborhood distanced themselves from him following his performance in the crucible. They thought he was too girly. Even now, Yusuf missed wearing costumes and having the makeup artist highlight his face. But he had a new role, one that came with props and a revolving stage. He kept the makeup kit in his briefcase. And every now and then, before stepping out of his car, he powdered his cheeks and forehead and put on eyeliner. That early afternoon in mid-September, when Yusuf arrived at the front door of Uncle Sam's house, leaves were starting to change color and fall. An American flag fluttered from a pole in the front yard. Banners sporting the logos of the Detroit Lions, the Detroit Tigers, the Detroit Red Wings, and the Detroit Pistons hung from the railing of the front porch. And there was even a banner for the Great Lakes Loons, a minor league baseball team based in Midland, Michigan. 
After the attacks of 9-11, Uncle Sam had begun decorating his house with patriotic and athletic symbols, even though he didn't care for baseball or football. He only knew that Americans were obsessed with their sports teams. He'd also change his name from Samir to Sam. The house was a one was a one story, and as he stood outside it, Yusuf realized that all the window blinds, or at least all the blinds he could see from the porch, were closed. When he knocked on the door, Uncle Sam opened it and stuck his head out while looking side to side. He quickly ushered Yusuf in and bolted the door behind him. He wore a gray Detroit Lions sweatshirt and matching gray sweatpants. His curly silver hair sat atop his head like a stormy sea. A short pudgy man, his eyes were red and swollen. He and Yusuf's brother, he and Yusuf's father had grown up together in Bintishbeil, a village in southern Lebanon near the Israeli border, where as boys they'd been inseparable, riding around town on the back of a donkey, taking turns with the reins. They'd even immigrated to the U.S. together after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, uh, after the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982, landing jobs at the Ford Rouge plant in Dearborn. After several years of standing on the assembly line and having to yell over the sound of churning machines, Uncle Sam had used all his savings to purchase a gas station on Schaefer Road. His business, has pro his business had prospered, allowing him to buy a house and start a family. However, when his patriotic fervor blossomed following 9-11, and he began calling his wife Hanan, Hannah, Hannah, and his sons Abdullah and Nasser, Abraham and Nicholas, and bought them all a Detroit Lions wardrobe. When he suspected that their landline was being tapped and that white men in suits walking in their neighborhood were either FBI or Homeland Security agents. When he nearly lost his mind, chewed his nails until they bled, could hardly sleep anymore, and spent every waking hour terrified that the government would accuse him of supporting terrorist organizations and then revoke his family's American citizenship and send them all back to Lebanon, or worse, to a black hole, his wife lost her hair from the stress he had put her under and asked for a separation. Uncle Sam ended up moving out and renting the house he now lived in. Since arriving in America close to 40 years ago, he had always felt that the government had its eyes on him and his fellow Arabs. Back in the 80s, he'd feared being mistaken for a hijacker. And then 9-11 had happened and his anxiety had skyrocketed. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Hassan, for that reading. Uh, if you just joined us, uh, I want to encourage you all to um, please donate. We've um, chosen two organizations that you can donate to tonight, uh, Palestine Legal and Palestine Children's Relief Fund. There are two QR codes behind one of my shoulders. Um, and I think this you'll find a link in the chat uh, box. So um, please consider a donation. Um, all those, uh, all the money you're, you'll be donating will go directly to those organizations. Um, so next up is uh, Lisa Suhera Majaj. Um, Lisa's not with us in person tonight, but she has recorded um, her presentation, which we will play. I'm gonna introduce her regardless. Lisa is a Palestinian American writer and editor and is the author of Geographies of Light, uh, which won the Dill Sill Press Poetry Prize in 2009. She's also the author of poems and essays in journals and anthologies across the US, Europe, Middle East, and India, a forthcoming poetry volume, Broken, Unbroken, and Two Children's Books. A scholar of Arab American literature, she also co-edited three volumes of critical essays on Arab, Arab American, and international women, women writers and is co-editing a forthcoming volume, Companion to Arab American Literature. She has taught at various institutions and spoken at World Court of Women Against War in Bangalore, London South Bank's Poetry International, Palestine Rights, Cyprus International Literary Festival, and other events in the US, Jordan, Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, Germany, Tunisia, Bahrain, and India. Her poems have been translated into Arabic, Hebrew, Greek, Indonesian, and Malayalam, and were displayed at, in the 2016 exhibition, Aftermath, The Fallout of War, America and the Middle East at the Harn Museum of Art. Hi, everyone. I'm so comforted to be here today with, with you across geographies and time zones in this space of support for Palestine. 
In thinking about this event, I remembered a child called Nariman, who in the bombing of Gaza in 2021 fled her home with her family, returning later to find her home destroyed, but her two pet birds alive and chirping under the rubble. She also had two fish, one called Horiya, which means freedom, and one called Ro, which means spirit or soul or breath. Horiya had died, but Ro was still alive. I want to dedicate my reading to the children of Gaza, children like Nariman, in hopes that their roh will sustain them through this horror and that they may have one day a life of horiya and song. All the poems I'll be reading today were written since October 7. This is a body. This is a body, body of flesh, body of bone, body of spirit, body of light, body of longing, body of dreams, body of bodies. This is a body, body with the chest broken open, body with the skull broken open, body with the spirit broken open, body without a body. This is a body, a body, body of wonder, body of hope, body of oceans, body of harbors. This is a body in fleshed, like yours. This is a body broken, like mine. See how we stutter through rubble, wounded till we fall. This is a body of words, a body of history, a body of knowledge. This is a body of fact and a body of lies. Here are the bodies sprawled in the street like puppets, the bodies dangling in frantic peril from ravaged roofs. Here are the bodies seized, the bodies fleeing, the bodies that stay alive with eyes that burn, limbs torn off, the bodies in which we die. This is a vessel of flesh, a shipwrecked hull. Here is a gasping breath, the vanishing shore. Here are the ones who drowned. The next poem is called Ya Amar. Amar means moon in Arabic, and the exclamation Ya Amar is to indicate something very beautiful. O oh, moon. My friend sends me photos of children lost to bombs, their still living faces shining like moons, Ya Amar, in hopes I will write poems to keep them alive. They are not lost, of course, but murdered, torn to bits. Sometimes we hide in language to make it through, though the children had nowhere to hide and didn't survive. Searching for words to stem the grief, I scroll through images, wincing at fresh young faces, the smiling eyes. People smiled in Gaza, I swear, despite everything. The pictures are easier to take than my newsfeed's cruel contortions, hands protruding from rubble, forearms and legs inscribed with names so that victims can be identified when beheaded by the rain of bombs. The children laughing into the camera, hugging siblings or parents, clutching a toy or ball or school bag, demand we refuse their destruction. Their shining eyes gaze out, trusting those beyond the lens to keep them safe, whole, alive. They do not know yet how this will end. Faces smeared with blood, hands clutching soot, Bodies cradled in a ragged heap by grievers who rock in anguish keening. At one bombing site, a girl lifted alive from the moonscape of devastation cries out to her rescuer, Amma, are you taking me to the cemetery? He exclaims tenderly, Cemetery? What cemetery? Look at you, child. You are alive and beautiful like the moon. But beyond them, the lunar arc etched into Gaza's black and broken sky is barely visible. Ya Amar, the sky is so dark. Ya Amar, the light has left us. Where is the moon? This next poem is called Gauze. In the past couple of months, I learned that the word gauze actually originates from Gaza, which was a textile center, especially for, for the fabric we call gauze. Gauze. When you learn that gauze comes from Gaza, 
you will begin to understand how light passing through translucent fabric illuminates the delicate porous openings between threads that interweave to allow molecules of air and light to flow from one place to another without blockade or border. And you begin to understand how gauze allows us to see, though dimly through the haze of grief, shrouding what is soft and vulnerable, like the length of fabric a child steals from her mother to drape across a table for a hideaway, peering out without understanding what is happening, too young to know yet that there is no hiding in Gaza. And through this haze, you may be able to glimpse the ones still alive this morning before the bombs found them, murmuring about hunger and the absence of bread, the softness within them reverberating like an echo past their now crushed bodies. And as you turn away in anguish or despair or shame, perhaps you will remember that gauze is also used to cover wounds, layering gently over the bleeding place of which Gaza has so many we cannot stop counting. And perhaps you too will begin to see through the haze of denial and scream, stop. The last poem is in memory of the Gazan poet and writer, Rafat Alarir, who was killed in a targeted assassination. Shroud of Light. If I must die, you must live to tell my story. Rafat Alarir. By the time they killed Rafat, there was nothing new about the rows of bodies rolled up in stark white shrouds, surprisingly unbesmirched by dust or blood, tied at both ends in neat bundles, sometimes in the middle too, so the sheet wouldn't slip, carried gently through streets on the way to mass graves. Those pits dug in whatever ground can be reached without the living being picked off by snipers. The unstained white of winding claws belying the odor of carnage permeating every crevice, miasma of death hanging like an ashen pall in the sky, clogging the lungs of those who still try to breathe. A newscaster said, children are meant to play in the dirt, but in Gaza, it's their shroud. Even that is beyond many. One Gazan wrote, if I die, please make sure my children's bodies are covered, not left open to wild dogs, the relentless howling sky. Lost beneath rubble, Rafat was denied a poet's burial, left only stone dust and concrete for his shroud. But the words that survive his death wrap his lingering spirit in a gauze of light. There's a Palestine that dwells inside all of us, he wrote. Take his words, inscribe them on a kite, brilliant white, to fly high over the terrible world, so that his death is a tale that brings hope, so that he lives, so that we live, so that Gaza becomes a place not of shrouds, but of freedom, kites rippling in sunshine, lit by the blaze of life. Inshallah. Thank you. I want to thank Lisa for, for that beautiful reading. Um, we're going to have uh, some time at the end of this to answer any questions you might have for the writers here. So if you do have questions, if anything has sort of, you know, given you an idea, made you think about something and you want to ask one of the four writers, well, actually, no, one of the three um, who are here today with us, um, please drop it in the chat and um, we can get them to, to answer your questions. Um, so finally, uh, our last reader tonight is Susan Mahdi Daraj. Daraj. Uh, she is an award-winning writer of books for adults and children. She won an American Book Award, two Arab American Book Awards, and a Maryland State Arts Council Independent Artist Award. In 2018, she was named a USA Artist Ford Fellow. Her books include her linked short story collection, A Curious Land, as well as the Farah Rocks children's book series. She lives in Baltimore, where she teaches creative writing at Hartford Community College and the Johns Hopkins University. Her new novel, Behind You is the Sea, will be published in January of next year by Harper Via. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Deanna, and to the staff of the museum for organizing this wonderful event. And thank you um, to Hassan and Leila and Lisa. I was just sitting, um, listening to Lisa and trying not to cry at her poems. She's just incredible. And Leila and Hassan, it's an honor to read with you as well. It's just a wonderful space to be in with all of you. Um, before I read, tonight is actually the first time I'm going to read ever from my new book. So I'm really like feeling very happy that I'll be reading from it for the first time with the Arab American National Museum, which is a home for all of us. Um, but I want to lift up another Palestinian writer, uh, and that is the poet Priscilla Wathington. When I was listening to Lisa's poems, I was thinking about Priscilla's poems as well. Um, Priscilla Wathington is a Palestinian American poet who wrote, her, her chapbook is called Paper and Stick. And I've been thinking a lot about her poems in the last 75 days because Priscilla worked for many years for Defense of Children International. And some of her poems capture the lives and experiences of Palestinian children who of course have been uh, among the 20,000 victims um, that we've seen in this terrible, terrible time. So I just wanted to lift up her work. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna read to you from my new, my debut novel, Behind You is the Sea. It's coming out next month from HarperCollins. And this is a book about Palestinians living in the diaspora. Um, that's sort of the theme that I write about all the time and I, I, before I read from this, I, I, I want to say to Palestinians in the diaspora, um, a lot of times because we are living in diaspora, you know, we're, we're connected to Palestine. Sometimes it feels like it's not a real connection, right? Because maybe your grandfather's from Palestine. Maybe you've never been to Palestine. Maybe you don't speak Arabic even, right? Maybe the only connection you have to Palestine are your grandmother's stories and your mother's cooking and, you know, your father's music. So maybe you have, maybe you don't always feel Palestinian, but I'm really proud of how Palestinians and diaspora have come together as a family in this moment to join together and say, stop the violence. Um, so, so this book, um, the, 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 the section I'm reading is about uh, my main character. His name is Marcus and he's a police officer living in Baltimore. And he has a very um, tenuous connection to Palestine. He also um, has lost he has lost connection with his father. His father, he and his father are estranged. They've been estranged for many years. This is earlier in the novel. But at the end, there's a section where he is called upon to um, come and and um, his father has died and he's called by the neighbors to come and check on his father who he will find is dead. And then his uncle will ask him, uh, will make a big request of him. So, so this is again from the point of view of Marcus, who's a Palestinian American police officer estranged from his father for many years. And this section of the novel is called Escorting the Body. Baba died on a Tuesday, but Marcus knew nothing until Thursday. It had been five years, of course, but the neighbors remembered that the cranky old man with the accent had a cop's son, so they left a message with the precinct. Your father hasn't come out of his house in a couple of days. The newspapers are piled up on the lawn. Marcus's old house key no longer worked. When Baba had told him, I'm finished with you and your sister, he must have meant it. So Marcus gave the front door one swift kick, pounding it with his boot, and the hinges screeched, loosening their grip on the frame. The second kick brought it down, and Marcus walked in like a conqueror. Though the smell was faint, he registered it immediately, but paused to survey the room first. A lonely umbrella stood tall in a bucket by the front door. Baba's brown cardigan draped over the armrest of the couch, which was covered with a bedsheet as it had always been. Marcus continued walking through the dining room, seeing the single plate with a fork, the food swept off cleanly, probably with a slice of bread. He found Baba lying on the kitchen floor, face up, his arms stretched outward like he was floating on water. The green sheen of his skin and the odor told him that it had been only two or three days at most. 
not much bloating yet. The joints were stiff like rocks. The examiner later confirmed the heart attack had killed him sometime around Tuesday morning. In the kitchen, Marcus found some dried clippings of peppermint leaves, blackened and shriveled, scattered on the counter, a cracked teacup in the sink. He'd been about to make his morning tea. It happened fast, the examiner said soothingly. I doubt he felt much pain. Marcus thanked him politely, wishing he hadn't already heard him say those exact words dozens of times to, to other grieving family members. Marcus's first call was to his sister, Emma. His second was to his aunt, Nadia, whom he didn't speak to, not really. He got, he got aunt Nadia's voicemail. Call me back, auntie, he said. He left that message in Arabic, almost laughing that someone he knew still used voicemail. I'm afraid I have bad news, he said. That should clue her in. She called him back quickly. Sorry, ya amti, Marcus said when he heard her voice on the other end of the phone. But my father has given you his remaining years. Bad news sounded kinder, almost generous in Arabic, as if the dead had decided to bestow a gift upon the living. It was also a sweet way of dodging the pain of saying, my father has died. My father who cut me out of his life is dead. He'd heard Arabs grieve, bef grieve before, but he'd forgotten the keening, the raspy sobs, the sayings. Allah yirhamu, may God have mercy on his soul. May God keep him in his grace. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Marcus really doubted that once God met his father, he'd want to keep him at all. But his aunt's husband, Uncle Walid, called him back an hour later. Marcus was surprised because Uncle Walid had not spoken to him since his son's wedding years before when they'd had an argument. Marcus, listen, he told him. You cannot bury him here in America. Why not, Marcus asked, asked suspiciously. There's a plot next to my mother. No, listen, Marcus, you have to take him home. He is home. No, ya Marcus, he has to be buried in Palestine, and you must take him there. Baba had allegedly said these words during a card game at Aladdin's, where Mr. Najib let them stay past closing hours back in the good old days. In front of Walid and six other men, Baba had raised his glass of arak and declared, when I die, make sure they bury me back home in my parents' grave site. This country has ruined my life. It won't have me in death, too. Apparently, it's what Baba had always wanted. Marcus fought it anyway. We promised him, Marcus, Walid said. We swore it. His uncle's voice was urgent, insistent. You were probably all drunk, Marcus reassured him, uh, reasoned with him, trying to keep his voice calm. We knew what we were doing, Walid insisted, and we promised him. Exactly, you promised him, so you take the body. You're his son, Marcus. Had the wajib. My duty, Marcus thought angrily. Of course, it wasn't them doing the paperwork. Walid would go only if he could, but as he told Marcus, he suspected he had an aneurysm, not that the doctor had diagnosed it, but he could feel it forming because all his kids drove him crazy and crossing the ocean in an airplane was playing with fire. Had the wajib, Marcus, he said again. How will I know what to do, Marcus said. I've never been to Palestine, not once in my life. It's your homeland, Marcus. That was Auntie Nadia, who took a turn getting on the phone to admonish him. That's a nice thought, Auntie, except I don't really know anything about getting there. You will find your way, said Auntie Nadia, had the wajib. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Susan. So... Again, um, we've got a few more minutes and I'm, you know, inviting everybody, anyone, if they have any questions, please drop it in the chat. Uh, another plug to uh, please donate to Palestine Legal or Palestine Children's Relief Fund. Uh, the QR codes are here on the top um, left corner. Um, so I, I'll start just by asking generally how all of you are doing the past few weeks. We've all been kind of dealing with this um, really heavy time. Um, yeah, just to sort of check in, how are you guys handling it? How has it affected your your work um, or, you know, at all? 
if at all. Not all at once, just. <laughs> yeah, Susan. I, I, I can just say, and, and I, I'm sure others feel the same way. I, I'm barely functioning, mm -hmm. you know, I'm barely functioning. Like I have a full-time job and um, I can't write anything original. I'm just scrolling through the news. And I think, I think what I'm feeling in the, beside the horror and, and, the, and, and the rage is like a sense of survivor's guilt, you know, like mm -hmm. I feel like this is such a horrific thing that's happening. And how many of us Palestinians um, in the diaspora are feeling that survivor's guilt, you know, like it's, 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 it's a horrible feeling. And I think there is, you know, I've read about things like witness trauma. Um, and I wonder if we're not all feeling that right now. Kassan or Leila, any, any thoughts? I'm just really struck by the disconnect. You know, there's people who are, you know, we're scrolling constantly and, you know, crying or mm -hmm. checking in or sharing stories. And then there's people who are like going out to dinner and talking about a cool thing they saw and and it's just it's very strange and it's not like they're bad people but mm -hmm. the dis the disconnect is odd it's mm -hmm. like living two worlds yeah i totally feel that i i was just telling that my wife earlier today that like the um the only comfort we have is um like when we play with our children who are very young and they're just so innocent they're completely unaware of the world, you know, their world is, you know, their mama and baba. And um, in a way it's it's our escape too, just to see their innocence. But like, right to your point, Leila, once you set up, step out of that house, um, you know, you're back, you, like just the reality hits you. And you just, especially in America, I mean, Jenny, you're, you're now in Dearborn. And, and so you, you're, you're surrounded by many more Arab Americans, right? Um, so the, the, the remote, there are more spaces to kind of to, to share what you're feeling, whereas mm -hmm. when you're not in such a concentrated Arab American community, it's a lot harder. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I spent most of my life in the U.S. on the East Coast um, and the, um, you know, also experiencing, you know, various wars um, and the climate, the environment, the atmosphere is completely different here in Dearborn. So um, one of the perks of, of, of living in Dearborn at a time like this is that um, you feel that everyone understands what you're going through and there's a kind of solidarity and, and um, you know, you don't have to explain yourself or, or anything like that. So I do appreciate sort of being in, in Dearborn uh, right now during this time. Mm -hmm. um, um, maybe Hassan, you can um, tell us a bit about how, I know I mentioned it at the beginning of the opening, um, my, my opening remarks about how this sort of happened. And maybe you can tell us a bit more about the genesis of this this idea. Yeah, I mean, like, so uh, Susan and Leila and, and, and um, Alia Yunus and Lisa and um, a, a, a bunch of other writers, um, Lena from from Mizna, um, we were just um, and Diana Abu Jabbar um, is in that group, and it just started where you know, actually, I think it, it, it was a wonderful space in the sense of like checking in on one another, um, and then it evolved to well, how can we kind of create some kind of space um, to kind of share um, voices and and draw awareness to what's going on in Palestine, um, to fundraise um, for Palestine, um, to celebrate Palestinian culture, Arab culture. Um, and that's where, and, and I think most of us in that group are, 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 are writers. And so that's where, you know, an idea for a reading came about. Um, and I know, you know, the Arab American National Museum, you all, uh, as Susan actually alluded to this, you're, you're really a home for um, so many of us. Um, so that that seemed to kind of be like the, a really great fit, and um, we're hoping that the, you know this is the inaugural reading. Maybe this could be like a, a monthly thing where we bring um, Arab and Arab American writers, maybe even writers, um, maybe non-Arab writers who are, are writing about 
Palestine or or, or um, the Arab diaspora, you know, in this safe space, um, you know, to um, to to kind of um, celebrate our culture. So, uh, and continue to fundraise um, for Palestine. Um, there will always be that need. So I'm hoping that this will kind of continue. Yeah, no, and 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 um, thanks for, for for saying that about the museum and, and also you, Susan, that we, we try to be a sort of a space mm-hmm. for um, you know Arab Americans of you know all walks of life, especially and especially artists, um, as a place where they can um, come together and 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 um, you know use it as a place for them to also create and and find community. Uh, there is a question that came from the audience. Um, the question is from Nisreen Hajjaj. How do we as artists contain our emotions and not let it take over? The pain is so immense. The survivor's guilt is real, but how do we turn it around and stay empowered to give? It's a great question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Susan. That is a great question. Um, I, I I feel like Right, like for me, like I know, like Lisa Majaj just read these beautiful poems that she's written since October 7th. Um, I know for me, I'm having a hard time writing anything right now. It's, it's like a, a big struggle. And I feel like that's okay. Like wherever you are in your process, that's okay. I think we're all just still absorbing and processing and, and that's part of the creative process. I think though, one thing you can do actively is just to lift up other writers. And I wanna reiterate something you said, Deanna, at the beginning that it's really important in this moment because right now, for everyone listening right now, please understand that Palestinian writers, there are attempts to cancel us. You know, there are, I've had events canceled. Others have had events canceled. Um, There are, you know, there's like soft censorship happening. So it's really important for people to uh, make sure that Palestinian voices stay, um, uh, you know, um, are not made invisible, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You can do that by like uplifting writers. You know, you know, when you buy an author's book, I promise you only like a dollar is getting to that author. It's, mm-hmm. We're not making millions of dollars over here, but but when you buy an author's book or recommend your local library to buy their book, that sends a signal to the publisher that there is active interest in these books. You cannot imagine how powerful that is. Um, a lot of bookstores, independent bookstores, before they even invite a writer to come and speak in their store, or if they're deciding whether or not to carry an author's books in their bookstore, they'll check the sales of that book. And if it has healthy sales, they'll put it in their bookstore. Not every bookstore carries every book. So. When you buy books and you promote books, you're 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 signaling something to publishers. That's really an important thing to do. So if you're if you're not able to like create yourself right now, that's fine. Just you know, just take your time, but but uplift other writers. That's that's kind of like what our one of our themes tonight was was lifting up other writers as well. Mm-hmm. Well said. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, no, and I, and I want to sort of, yeah, really encourage everybody um, listening in to, you know, Christmas is around the corner. If you're celebrating, you want to buy gifts. I think, you know, authors here have several books on, in their names. Um, the Arab American National Museum has a book awards program, and you can find um, past winners on our uh, website. Um, please look at those, consider those books. Um, as possible gifts, or even just for yourself, and to, to please encourage everyone to read um, uh, books written by those writers. Um, yeah, I just, I mean, this, I, I, Nasreen's question is really, you know, really tough to stay. I mean, it's a, it's a great, great question, and it makes me think a lot about even our work as, you know, at the museum, as, as you know, workers in the creative um, arts sector. Um, how do we show up? How do we, um, you know, operate as a museum? Like, what's the role of the museum in a time like this? And um, I think one of the ways that we've tried to, you know, respond to um, not just what's happening in Gaza, but just, you know, to a community that's in crisis is to have events like this where we can shed some light mm-hmm. 
on uh, what's happening in, in you know our part of the world, but also uplift um, you know writers, artists like yourselves. Um, yeah. Any any other questions from the audience? I want to give you all an opportunity. Any final words from, we're, we're almost coming to a close. Any final words from, from you all, Susan, Leila, or Hassan? I'd like to just thank you all again and say what a delight it is to, to read with you again, Susan, and to meet you in person, Hassan, and just to be part of this thing you know, the, the, like I said in the beginning, the swiftness with which it came to, to be. Um, we were looking at the Irish, you know, there was like an Irish uh, photography something and they were selling prints and every print sold was, you know, going, uh, was as given as donation. And it was this huge group of photographers who were like, how can we make this? How can we do this? And to see it go from a little teeny idea to this, I mean, so quickly is, I think, testament to um, the, the potential for change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for um, coming tonight, for joining us. Um, I want to thank all of you in the audience for uh, coming and showing up. Those of you who donated to either Palestine Legal or PCRF, I want to appreciate, I want to thank you uh, for your generosity. Um, stay tuned, we might have a part two to this and this might become a monthly thing, but um, time will tell. And I do want to just thank everybody again um, for um, coming and being with us tonight. Thanks. <laughs>